The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending upon where you are. This is Donna Russell. I'm filling in for Dr. Barkin, as she's on vacation this week with her family in an RV in the Badlands. She was really unsure of internet services, so I hope she's having a great week off. Today, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Charles D. Sturgis completed medical school at the University of Kansas in 1992. Following school, he matriculated in the Combined Anatomic and Clinical Pathology Residency Program at Northwestern University's McGaw Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois, in completing that program in 1997. Residency was followed by a year of fellowship in cytopathology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Sturgis' prior professional roles have included positions as, as the Director of FNA Services at Pittsburgh's Allegheny General Hospital, the Director of Cytopathology at Evanston Northwestern Healthcare, PLLC Board Member at Selmex, Selmetics, Pathology in Seattle, Washington, and Associate Professor of Pathology at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. Dr. Sturgis is now Professor of Pathology and Director of the Pathology Residency Training Program at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. His chief interests include cytopathology, breast pathology, and education. I'd also like to say that he's a member of the ASC Executive Board as well as the Cytology Program Review Committee. His presentation this afternoon is on cerebral spinal fluid, cytopathology perspectives on this much needed bath for your brain. Thank you, Dr. Sturgis, for presenting this afternoon. Oh, Donna, it is my pleasure, and thanks for that very robust introduction. Um, it's nice to talk with everybody. I, I joke a little bit about spinal fluid being a good bath for your brain, and that's actually true. It does kind of uh, remove metabolites and performs a lot of vital functions for our brains. Um, I, I don't mean to imply that any individual out there has a dirty mind, but it, it's, a, it's a fun joke to toss around. I do think that um, I was destined when I started off in pathology to be interested in C CSF because CSF can also stand for Chuck Sturgis fluid. Um, so I, I, I kind of like, you know, it's me. I have no important disclosures and the program overview is pretty um, simplistic in the sense that we're gonna start with normal, go through uh, processing, talk about benign disease conditions and wrap up with um, neoplasia and malignancy. So this is a great article that I have been using for um, gosh, almost 20 years. That's about um, leukocyte migration in the central nervous system. And the CNS has uh, kind of three different routes for leukocytes or white blood cells being able to get into the spinal fluid. Two of those are arterial blood supply. Um, and then one is the spinal fluid pathway. And CSF is actively secreted by choroid plexus epithelium in the ventricular system. It circulates from the ventricles to the subarachnoid space between the pia and arachnoid um, membranes. And then it is resorbed to the systemic, circu systemic circulation through the arachnoid villi in the venous sinuses. Um, one of the nice things about this paper, this excellent review article, which actually comes from authors who were centered at that time at the Cleveland Clinic, is that memory T cells, which is at the bottom of this slide here, can migrate from blood through the subarachnoid space and then back to the systemic circulation. So if you follow this little kind of dotted line here, that's the route through which they can get out. And this is the way we can have immune responses that are in an environment which is otherwise kind of cordoned off or contained. Uh, CSF is classically regarded as an ultra filtrate of plasma. And so like some people may think of spinal fluid in the way we think of urine, but really that is not the case. CSF is actually more akin to or similar to tears or to mucus in the sense that it isn't just taking blood and filtering something out and being left with the product. 
spinal fluid is actually secreted by epithelial cells. Um, and that's maybe a different mind frame or a different setting than some people um, have about where spinal fluid comes from. Persons who are aged greater than five years have a total CSF volume of about 150 milliliters. Now, a very large person will have a slightly larger volume than a very small person, but one of the things I have sometimes heard from clinicians is, you know, we, we're not going to give you much spinal fluid because our patient is a child. And if the patient is a neonate or an infant, that is very true. But if the patient is seven, that is generally not very true because after you get to be about five years of age, you have kind of a standard volume of spinal fluid. So that's something that if you're working in a, a patient uh, population where you see peds uh, uh, patients, um, you can do a little educating. Uh, human spinal fluid volume turns over roughly four times a day. So as you're, you know, sitting, doing your work, screening slides, performing FNAs, doing quality control, eating lunch, your uh, choroid plexus is like a little factory that's just making more and more spinal fluid all the time without you being aware of it. I have thought before that that might be a way that I could lose some weight would be to get my choroid plexus to be going really, really fast and I could make, you know, 40 times the amount of spinal fluid a day and burn calories. The problem with that is it, it might be healthy with weight loss, but it would result in too much fluid in a confined space. And I would have to have some mechanism for resorbing all of that extra spinal fluid. So I've, I've decided to just go with the flow. The CNS lacks lymphatic channels. So in some ways, spinal fluid can be thought of as lymph for the CNF, CNS, even though that is, it is a very different fluid. Uh, there can be some direct communication between spinal fluid and um, the environment outside of the skull, uh, in, even in physiologic settings. And those can happen with um, drainage of minute amounts of CSF across um, the cribriform plate and also um, around some cranial nerves. And those are ways in which there can be communication between kind of the inside world and the outside world in the head. This is a diagram that shows in a pictorial way the ventricular system of the brain, which are the hollow areas inside the substance of the brain. And the choroid plexus, which I have circled here in black, lives in the central uh, portions of the ventricular system. And that's where we're creating this fluid. But the fluid can fill, actually does fill all of these areas in blue. And this is a histologic um, section, one at low power, one at a higher power of the choroid plexus. It kind of looks like little pieces of cauliflower or broccoli, grossly, like little um, uh, complex stems. And the cells at the surface, which are the true epithelial cells, are the cells that secrete this uh, clear fluid. And we see this most commonly, in my experience, in the setting of autopsy when we are studying normal neuroanatomy. And that's where these slides come from. Um, in general, that epithelium is one flat layer. You can see, depending on the tangent of the cut, uh, sheets of this um, epithelium. And I think of this as kind of being analogous to mesothelial cells that line the flat serous membranes of um, the abdomen and the thoracic cavity and the pericardium and some other body sites. Although those cells are not necessar don't necessarily have a secretory function, the morphology is very similar with kind of a flat, evenly spaced cells. And these cells can shed in certain settings into the spinal fluid and be present in sheets the same way we would think of mesothelial cells in other body fluids. This is an example of a cytology case. This is a cytospin preparation that's dip quick stain from a patient who has a shunt where there's a little plastic tip of tubing in the ventricle and that can irritate the um, choroid plexus and cause shedding of groups of cells. So knowing the history of shunt is very important because when you have this indwelling form device that can cause mechanical abrasion of those cells and they appear with this morphology.
So the other kind of benign lining cell are ependymal cells. And on one side, those cells have a more glial appearance and phenotype. On the other side, they're ciliated and they have a more kind of epithelial cell. So there, you can think of these cells in kind of a, a sense as like a hybrid cell type where we have both glial and epithelial phenotypes potentially. Um, these cells can also shed uh, into the spinal fluid. Uh, this is an example of a case where I diagnosed uh, ependymal cells. And when you see ependymal cells, it's in certain settings. You can see them post-operatively when someone's had surgical manipulation. Um, you can see them after head trauma where the benign lining cells of the ventricles are abraded. So if someone was in a motor vehicle accident or had other head trauma. Another setting is you can see them kind of normally or um, not in association with significant pathology in patients who are very, very young because the germinal matrix um, um, brain substance is fragile and shedding of those cells happens. This is a five week old female who came into the emergency room with the question of rule out a CNS infection, had a spinal tap. We have some not so well preserved red blood cells in the background and then we have like a three dimensional aggregate of epithelial looking cells. And one of the things that I think our hematopathology colleagues have as a leg up on us in cytology is they often look at cells under oil immersion or a 100x and here in my photograph you see the ciliation which is not very nice and makes you feel comfortable that this is a non-neoplastic process and these represent um, uh, a benign population. This case came to me from a practicing pediatric pathologist colleague friend of mine that I worked with a number of years ago and she had a concern about the possibility of some occult small blue cell tumor in this young patient. And I was able to say very comfortably that even though there was, this was a little spooky looking, that in this clinical setting, these were definitely benign. And that put everybody at ease. This is a picture from a publication from just a few years ago, 2015, where some authors gave these cells as examples of ependymal cells after trauma. I actually think that these cells may be choroid plexus cells because they look more flat and epithelial and more rem are to me more reminiscent of kind of quote unquote mesothelial cells. The take home message I wanna reinforce is whether you think cells are ependymal or derived from choroid plexus, they're all benign. And so if you aren't exactly certain, but you, you're confident they're benign, you can use a descriptive language and just say something like negative from malignant cells, benign lining cells. And that will put everyone at ease and make everyone comfortable. So after we make the spinal fluid, we have to kind of reabsorb it because if our machinery that's making four times the volume of 150 milliliters a day keeps going and we can't get rid of it, um, then we get a backup and we have too much pressure in the head. So the spinal fluid is reabsorbed in these structures called arachnoid granulations. And these are kind of set up in a way where um, flow will process in only one direction so you don't experience a backflow of venous blood or of old spinal fluid back into the head. Those can be damaged and or plugged by say uh, metastatic disease or inflammation and that can result in uh, increased pressure. So the normal cellular constituents of spinal fluid are two cell types only. So if you see anything in a spinal fluid other than a few small mature looking lymphocytes and a rare monocyte, that cell should likely not be there. One question I get asked about is, uh, what are adequacy criteria for spinal fluid? Well, a normal spinal fluid has nothing in it except maybe, you know, in a cytospin, you might have like five li small lymphocytes and one monocyte. So if you try to establish specific cellular criteria that you need to see in order to call something adequate, we would be calling a lot of spinal fluids, you know, unsatisfactory or not adequate. 
So I don't have any specific criteria to call something adequate and what I say is what I see. So this is an example where we have a few erythrocytes in this difficult stained cytospin. We have a small lymphocyte and then a slightly larger mononuclear cell. We have a history of headache, you know, that's not very specific, but this is a case where I would say this is within normal limits. And often when we have just a few erythrocytes, those are derived from a slight trauma because even the best neurologist or best emergency room physician or internist or neurosurgeon will get a small amount of bleeding when they, when they um, do the sampling. So <laughs> this is a kind of a comic slide that I created a number of years ago, but what is the blood brain barrier? And I thought, you know, it's like something you could say, welcome to the stage, the blood brain barrier and have like some rockers come out all dressed up. Um, I think it's a concept that I struggled with when I was trying to learn about the blood brain barrier. But in this, this kind of illustration in the lower right hand corner, you see that we have like the um, glial cells sending out these little foot processes and those uh, seal off the vasculature. And then the endothelial cells themselves that are lining these blood vessels have tight junctions that prevent um, materials from being able to go in and out of the microvasculature. And this is different than in the rest of the body. And the reason for this is to try to keep things out of the brain, because if something gets in there, then it's hard to do anything about it because we have a limited ability to make a serious immune response. And it's a protected environment at a constant temperature with oxygen. So we don't want like microbes or malignant cells to get in there because once they get in there, it can be challenging to do anything about them. So that's my kind of spin on the blood brain barrier. So how do um, neoplastic cells get into the head? So they could cross the choroid plexus. They can traverse the blood brain barrier. One disease that has been a, a real struggle for decades or centuries in a sense, where we know people will commonly have central nervous system involvement is acute lymphocytic leukemia or ALL. And recently, this is a paper from late 2018 that showed that there, there are mechanisms other than traversing the choroid plexus or traversing the blood brain barrier for neoplastic cells to enter the CSF. And in this instance, what these investigators did was they showed that blood vessel basement membrane is very rich in laminin and that almost all ALL cells express a laminin receptor called alpha-6 integrin. So if you look in this little box here, what happens is those neoplastic cells actually bind to those receptors and travel along um, the basement membrane, like on the outside of the vasculature, so they're not you're really using the blood vessel themselves, like the lumen of the blood vessel or crossing the blood brain barrier. And they used a mouse model to show that if you get rid of that um, alpha-6 integrin receptor, then you don't have this uh, problem. So there are different routes of getting in and out of the head. And this is a very elegant way of showing how um, if we don't treat people who have ALL, like more than half of them without CNS prophylaxis will develop CNS involvement. And it's through a very unique mechanism. So how do we collect spinal fluid? This is a photograph here of Dr. Heinrich Quinke, who was a German internal medicine doctor. And he actually developed the technique of doing the lumbar puncture where he would put the needle through two between two vertebral spaces and then thread it into the space where the spinal fluid is. And he was doing this not to make diagnoses, but to, in a therapeutic sense, to re, uh, release pressure from patients who had hydrocephalus or water on the brain, you know, too much uh, spinal fluid. And then the technique became more widely available and it's now the standard way in which we sample spinal fluid. So if the specimen is collected via lumbar puncture, you can see certain contaminants and that's those contaminants are derived from the pathway that the needle takes through the skin to get into the space where the spinal fluid lives. And those can include a chondrocyte, 
uh, squamous epithelial cell, bone cells like an osteoblast, or bone marrow elements. And here we have a picture of both red and white blood cell precursors and a megakaryocyte. So if you see one giant megakaryocyte, you could be thinking, oh, that's a malignant cell. So if we know what uh, contaminants we might expect to see that can benefit us from in a way that we don't overcall them as neoplastic or potentially malignant. One thing that I struggle with is we aren't always told or we're actually uncommonly told how did that spinal fluid get out of the patient. Another way in a hospital setting that we see spinal fluid commonly is when a person has an indwelling um, reservoir. Dr. Omaya was a Pakistani neurosurgeon who developed this uh, reservoir system where you have a semi-permeable membrane and a little catheter-like tail that goes into one of those hollow ventricles. And if someone needs intrathecal or intracranial, another word, um, uh, therapy, where they're giving them, say, antibiotics or uh, anti-neoplastic agents like chemotherapy directly into the head, instead of giving them repeated lumbar punctures, if they have a reservoir, they can uh, with uh, the surgeon or whoever's caring for the patient can withdraw a certain volume, like have the patient lie down and take out 10 milliliters of fluid of the spinal fluid, and then install 10 milliliters of therapy, keeping the patient's intracranial pressure constant and intracranial volume constant. So we're gonna, we're probably not going to see megakaryocytes as a contaminant here. But we might see other things like small particles of neuropill or of brain tissue. And this is an example of a patient where it's a young patient who has a reservoir. And every so many days when they're getting their chemo instilled, they take out a certain volume of fluid and send that to the lab. So these particles of neuropill would be like a contaminant because the tip of the catheter from the... Um, reservoir is um, irritating the lining of the brain from the inside. Another time when we will see contaminants like that is when people have shunts. And a shunt is designed to carry excess fluid from the ventricular system to some other body site where it can be resorbed. The most common shunts we see today are ventriculoperitoneal or VP shunts. And in that setting, um, the fluid is carried away to the abdomen where this, this very small amount of fluid is reabsorbed by the peritoneal lining. Though the end of the shunt, instead of going from the ventricle down to the abdominal cavity, can also go into the pleural space or the pericardial space. These shunts can, if say you have an infection in your abdomen and you have a shunt, then that could be a route by which the infection can spread up into the head. So that's another thing to keep in mind, as you may see inflammatory processes. And these are examples of small particles of neuropill uh, in a pap-stained um, cytospin preparation up here and in a diff-quick stained cytospin preparation in the lower right-hand corner, corner. So you see kind of like this granular material with cells embedded into it, which may be glial cells or neural cells. This is an example of a patient who has a reservoir and had a tap and my trainee who saw this case was concerned that these large kind of branching structures could be fungus. But when we look at higher power, our quote unquote fungus has endothelial lining cells. And this is actually a small group of capillary sized blood vessels from which the neuropill, which is out here, has been kind of separated. So you can see little blood vessels in a spinal fluid and that can be in a patient who has a shunt or a reservoir can be an expected finding. So when we have these um, uh, collections where we get them from a reservoir or from a shunt, we don't want to overcall contaminants. We also want to keep in mind that what we see in spinal fluid is kind of what we get. And if someone is being treated for their disease, the neoplastic cells can take on a degenerative appearance and they will decrease ideally in number over time. So the specificity of spinal fluid, whether you're collecting it with a lumbar puncture or from a reservoir or from a shunt, is not ideal. Um, and that 
the numbers I'm giving you here are for the average spinal fluid, it's very high uh, specificity, meaning if you see something that's abnormal, that's a good finding and you should report it. But the sensitivity for an individual collection can be very low, meaning a person can have disease and not have that disease collected even in a very good collection. And that's because the disease burden may be low. If the patient has a malignancy over time, that will come to fruition. So by repeated sampling, you will render the right diagnosis. One thing we can do when we're dealing with hematologic malignancies is to use ancillary testing. And if we use flow cytometry, here we have patients who by morphology in this study were either negative or atypical, but by flow positive findings were confirmed. So, you know, uh, we, it's always ideal when we have the ability to do additional tests, whether those are for hematologic malignancies or for confirming specific infections where we might do culture or molecular microbiologic testing to take advantage of all those uh, modalities. Um, it's good to know whatever your normal values are in your lab for spinal fluid, because if you see data and you don't know where that fits in the normal um, uh, range, then you won't know what is normal and what is abnormal. One thing that's pretty standard is to have, from a cell perspective, like fewer than five uh, red blood cells, and you really should not, or sorry, white blood cells, and pretty much all of those should be lymphocytes or a rare monocyte, and you should see no red blood cells and no neutrophils. Uh, sometimes if the tap is particularly bloody, we can have a lot of red blood cells and we can see neutrophils because they come in with the blood. Some you know, tip-offs that, that you're dealing with is a traumatic tap and not a pathologic bleed is that there's more blood in the first tube than in the last tube. Uh, that the supernatant is clear. Um, if there's fresh blood, it may clot, whereas if it's old blood, the clotting factors will have been consumed. And then the morphology will look different. The red blood cells will be nicely preserved in a fresh um, hemorrhage as in comparison to having a degenerated appearance and an associated hemosiderin in old blood. So this is an example of a couple of small lymphocytes, some fibrin and a macrophage that has coarse granular golden brown pigment. So that's a patient who had about three months ago surgery and I would attribute that um, hemosiderin laden macrophage to old hemorrhage likely related to the surgery. A question I sometimes get is, is about, you know, if you have a few small mature appearing lymphocytes, how do you know you're not missing some deceptively low grade um, lymphoproliferative disorder like CLL or SLL? So in general, um, low grade lymphomas do not involve the central nervous system. And if they do, it's generally secondary involvement at the very end of a patient's disease process. So if the patient has a history of CLL and you have rare lymphocytes, and if you have any red blood cells, there's kind of no way to know, even if you do flow, you may confirm um, a neoplastic population. I would almost always say that those cells are derived from blood. And that's a discussion you might have with the hematologist or oncologist if there's a question. This is some very basic information taken from Dr. DeMay's fabulous textbooks. Uh, the one thing I would point out to any uh, learners that we have online, like students of cytotechnology, pathology residents and fellows is when you're taking an exam and they give you history, one of the things that is, doesn't make sense to me, and I don't have a thing to keep in mind that can cause a dramatically increased spinal fluid uh, pressure is lead poisoning. The rest of these kind of make like physiologic sense. So that's like a tip for test taking, but it's not something you're going to use much in routine clinical practice. Looking at uh, protein and glucose levels is can be more commonly helpful. And one of the things to keep in mind is as cytologists, the two things we're usually trying to rule in or rule out are malignancy and infection. 
And so um, increased protein can be seen in association with malignancies. Um, decreased glucose is often seen in bacterial meningitis, can be seen with tumors because the tumor cells, if they're viable, will eat up the glucose or use the glucose as a fuel for metabolism. Generally, decreased glucose is not associated with viral meningitis or viral meningitis. So how do we make our spinal fluids? That's you know unique to each laboratory. I am a proponent of having two stains to look at the spinal fluid. So I like the cytospin or cytocentrifuge uh, preparations because then I can have both the Papanicolaou stain and the Diffquick stain. I learned my kind of hematolymphoid morphology on a right type stain or a modified beam stain, and I'm more comfortable with that. But in certain practices, people use thin prep and PAP only. And it, I think it's whatever you're comfortable with and whatever works best in your lab is maybe what you should do. Many years ago, people used um, membrane preps, and I, I don't particularly care for those. But, you know, again, it's what, what you like. I don't think that there is necessarily a right or wrong. Occasionally, cell blocks can be useful. This is a paper from 2015 saying that the initial detection of thin prep uh, was significantly higher than for cytospin when you're looking at um, diagnosing um, spinal fluid morphology. But this study was focusing only on solid tumors. So like if you have, say, a carcinoma that is metastasized to uh, the CSF. So this would support maybe using spinal um, thin prep in those settings. And they have a beautiful table with the example of um, different morphologies, including carcinomas and melanomas. Uh, this is a more recent study that came from the CAP Cytopathology Committee. Um, many of the authors are friends of mine. Um, and um, what this paper showed was that um, there was concordance with reference diagnosis um, that was slightly better for uh, modified gene sustained preparations compared with PAP stained preparations. And this is looking at kind of a very large number of users from all different types of laboratories. Um, and that, that was there was a statistically significant p value, even though the, the, the numbers themselves are not that different. Um, and the cases in which that was noticeably um, better were cases where there were hemat hematologic malignancies involving the CSF. So I think that might support my concept that having both kinds of slides is beneficial. So this is an example of kind of where a case where we have a, a spinal fluid and we have a, a, an increase in the number of cells, but those are benign. So we have small mature looking lymphocytes and then lymphocytes that are perhaps a little larger and then we have some monocytes. And I would sign that out as negative and say I have small mature appearing lymphocytes, reactive lymphocytes and a few monocytes. Um, I think in some instances where we have the reactive pleocytosis, like here we have a monocyte type cell and then we have lymphs that are larger, it can become challenging, especially where if we don't have a lot of history or we don't have uh, ancillary testing to decide if this is reactive versus could this be some kind of lymphoproliferative disorder. Um, I think we can also have acute inflammatory processes like this where um, there's head trauma, with a shunt and the patient has essentially, you know, pus in the CNS. This is less challenging morphologically, but certain, certainly on the far end of the spectrum of a reactive condition. Um, another thing to keep in mind about reactive conditions is we classically think of viral meningitis as having a mononuclear response. But early in viral meningitis, we can actually see an increase in the number of segmented neutrophils. And these images come from patients who were in a study I did a number of years ago um, with one of my then residents, Dr. Robal, who now works in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Um, and over time, you see a transitioning with viral meningitis away from uh, a neutrophil predominant response to a mixed morphology and then ultimately to a mononuclear cell process. 
This is a great article from Dr. Prayson, who's a world-renowned neuropathologist at the Cleveland Clinic. And the conclusions say, after looking at a, a total of, you know, almost 6,000 specimens, that infectious agents were rarely identified in the pediatric population and that in adults, the most commonly identified organism was cryptococcus. Primary central nervous system neoplasms account for a high percentage of cases in kids, whereas in adults, it's generally metastatic disease. And the most common primary malignancy in children is medulloblastoma. So if you can recognize medulloblastoma, metastatic disease, and cryptococcus, you're probably going to get 90% of your spinal fluid cases correct. So in cryptococcal meningitis, when you're not focusing in on the organisms, what you see is a pleocytosis with small limbs, larger limbs, maybe a plasmacytoid cell like this one here. And in this thin prep um, preparation, in addition to those mononuclear cells, which are kind of caught up in a fibrin clot, you can also see the organism, which will appear with a capsule and then the central small uh, yeast form. And if you're comfortable, you can make a morphologic diagnosis on that. You might share with a microbiology colleague. You wanna look also at maybe serologic results and compare with culture. In this particular case, we made a cell block. And here in the cell block, you see the fibrin clot with the white blood cells, the mononuclear lymphocytes. And the organism appears as a negative image. Whereas in the special stains, which were performed in the Alcian Blue PAS and the GMS, it stains the way you would expect fungus to stain. And those can make you feel much more confident to give a specific diagnosis. In some centers, these special stains are performed on cytospins and or on thin preps. So if you're not comfortable making a cell block, but you think you have a little bit of fluid left, that's another way of, of making more out of a very small specimen. This is not my own image. It's something that I took out of a publication. But this is an example of Lucy Carmen staining, which is can be very helpful. I have this little India ink inset to show the narrow base budding. This is described in textbooks, and it's something that I learned, you know, 30 years ago in training, but is no longer used in the clinical setting generally. So we can see lymphoid pleocytoses and other benign and reactive conditions, Lyme disease being one. And also in tertiary syphilis, um, syphilis isn't a diagnosis you can make on spinal fluid, but if you have a good morphology, you can use other laboratory tests. Currently, there are other um, enzyme-linked um, uh, and chemiluminescent assays which give a greater sensitivity and a greater specificity than the old VDRL. So you might talk with your clinical lab colleagues uh, or leadership about you applying those tests to spinal fluid. Here's a patient who has a uh, headache and photophobia one year after small bowel transplant. And she has kind of a, a, a varied morphology, but some very large mononuclear cells that are concerning. And the question was, could she have a post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder? And I was actually favoring a neoplastic process here. So like the same day that we got her spinal fluid, she had a CNS procedure. And this is a touch preparation down here in the lower left-hand corner made from a piece of brain tissue that shows the exact same somewhat varied morphology. And this was confirmed to be a post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. And this is the positive EVER with those uh, EBV infected neoplastic uh, lymphoid cells cuffing this small blood vessel. You can do kind of any test that you would do in any other cytology sample in spinal fluid. The struggle is just having enough cellularity to get those tests to work. Uh, another condition where we see kind of an unusual population of white blood cells in the spinal fluid is um, neurocystosis uh, caused by tinea solium infection. This is a case that I saw in a different um, job when I was working at Evanston Hospital of a Guatemalan immigrant 
And, you know, the history here is we, the patient at some point has probably eaten undercooked pork and then the life cycle happens in the patient. And what we saw, we saw no organisms, but we saw a very remarkable uh, CSF eosinophilia. And so even though we're going to say this is negative for malignancy, we want to mention that there's this marked increase in the number of eosinophils and that can help the clinical team target um, or limit their diagnoses to things like parasitic infections, which was what was confirmed in this case, or um, uh, specific types of inflammatory reactions that are allergies or to certain drugs. Um, and in the pep stain slide from the same patient, I think we have all those EOs. They just don't stand out quite as well because we're used to thinking of them in, in a modified INSA or diff quick stain, but we note that those are, the cells are binucleated and then they have the beautiful eosinophilic granules in the cytoplasm. The eosinophilic granules don't jump out quite as much in the pap stain, but you'll note that those cells are binucleated. So if you're looking at slides and you have a lot of quote unquote binucleated polys, those are likely to be eosinophils. This is a patient with a very young patient for non-small cell lung cancer who developed a bacteremia and then developed a CNS, secondary CNS involvement and sadly died very quickly. But this is a spinal fluids sh slide showing, you know, tens of thousands of bacteria and also with an accompanying acute inflammation. And this is an example of uh, varicella zoster virus meningitis in a spinal fluid. And here, this is a case where I would actually be concerned about the morphology because there are so many of the large cells with uh, more open chromatin and macronucleoli, but doing flow cytometry confirms that the plasmacytoid cells that are present are a mixture of kappa and lambda and fits with the, with the um, patient who has immunocompromise. And we were label, later able to confirm um, that the patient had a systemic um, BZV infection. So in another case that's uh, kind of the different corollary, we're given an older patient who has a known history of prostate carcinoma and we see this morphology in the spinal fluid. It looks like a malignancy, but doesn't look what I might expect for prostate carcinoma. And it would also be unusual for prostate carcinoma to be involving the spinal fluid. We don't see that very commonly. So here, our ancillary testing with flow cytometry confirms a B cell population with a monoclonal um, uh, lambda light chain restriction and supports the diagnosis of a large B cell lymphoma. So a new or second malignancy for this patient. So moving away from hematologic malignancies and going more towards solid tumors, um, uh, when we have a patient where we have uh, known high-grade lymphomas, like in this slide, that can be, um, you know, reassuring because the patients have known histories. But some of these cells can take on a morphology that I kind of jokingly or laughingly refer to as the bullwinkle effect, where the nuclei look like they have antlers. I'm not sure always if that is the nature of the cells or if that's the nature of the preparation, because when you cytospin something, you can induce artifact, but this might make me think, you know, could this be like a carcinoma cell? Uh, so keeping an open mind, even when you're provided with the history, can be valuable. And um, sometimes uh, uh, leukemias can also present and or uh, develop um, involvement of the spinal fluid. And these are examples of BALL involving the spinal fluid, and they, these cells would have gotten in by that um, integrin pathway that I talked about earlier to the spinal fluid. And here the chromatin is, I think, a little more open and we have huge uh, pale nucleoli. Uh, generally, these patients will have a known history, but people can present with involvement of spinal fluid as the, the primary finding. Secondary involvement by other lymphomas is possible. This is an example of mantle cell lymphoma. And this can be confirmed, like I'm showing you here, by flow cytometric studies. Um, mantle cell lymphoma, in my experience, has striking monotony. 
whereas uh, reactive pleocytosis will have a distinct variability in cell types. And this is the solid tumor, especially in the, in the young adult or pediatric, pediatric population where I have seen that kind of same bullwinkle appearance where the nuclei are becoming almost multi-lobated appearance, but this is a solid tumor, medulloblastoma. So knowing the patient's clinical setting, imaging, findings, and history can make a big difference in you know, sticking a pin in the right diagnosis. I think also here the chromatin is more finely granular and we are lacking those large nucleoli that we might expect to see in a kind of a leukemia or high-grade lymphoma. We also have some uh, cohesion and a little bit of molding, which we, we would not expect in a leukemia or in a lymphoma. So if you are good with medulloblastoma and you see a couple of cases, that's going to be the most common primary uh, CNS tumor that you'll see in um, spinal fluid specimens, especially in young adults and children. So this is an example of a young uh, person, a 14-year-old boy who has a known history of alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma of the hand and developed widely metastatic disease. You can see here in the imaging that there's a little defect here and there's a little space here and this the, the port or the reservoir is a little bit out of this field for the image, but that's the tip is going down into the ventricular system. So when you have a spinal fluid on a patient and then like eight days later, 10 days later, 12 days later, you get another spinal fluid and then eight or 10 or 12 days later, you get another spinal fluid. That can be a tip off, even if you don't have the history that this is a patient who's getting interval draws that are on a regular schedule. And that's often because the patient is getting antibiotics or anti-neoplastics delivered into the CNS. And if you look at the slides over time, one way of measuring whether or not their therapy is working is if the number of cells decreases and goes away and you see increasing degeneration. So this is a malignant small blue cell tumor by morphology and the cells have these very kind of raisinoid wrinkled nuclei and the chromatin is very delicate. So I don't think this necessarily looks like a hematologic malignancy, but I would not be able to say with certainty that it were rhabdomyosarcoma, say, versus Wilms tumor or neuroblastoma or some other pediatric small blue cell tumor. And I would have to know the history and or do some type of um, special studies like immunohistochemistry or immunocytochemistry to confirm a specific diagnosis, but I would be able to say that these are malignant and we could follow them over time. So uh, a morphologic differential diagnosis from spinal fluid like this image on the left would be small cell carcinoma. Well, we would not expect to see metastatic small cell carcinoma of the lung in a 14-year-old who was never a smoker. So knowing the clinical setting is hugely important. Um, here, the morphology is somewhat similar, although we don't have the degree of um, nuclear membrane irregularity. One thing you can do is oftentimes when people have metastatic disease to the head, they already have their known primary. So this was a case where I was able to get that patient's EBA slides out and compare them to the spinal fluid and that was very reassuring because the morphology was essentially identical. Uh, breast cancer is something that we see uh, not uncommonly metastasizing to the meninges. And the morphology can be different depending on what the morphology of the primary was. If the primary was a high-grade ductal, the metastasis will look the same. Um, if the primary, like in this case, was an invasive lobular carcinoma, the cells can be deceptively small seek out something that you have as an internal reference, like this is a normal red blood cell. So this cell is bigger than a white blood cell would we might expect for a lymphocyte, but this cell could be the same size as a cell in a monocyte or macrophage series. It does have kind of a signet ring type morphology. Um, and knowing the patient's history would be of paramount importance in a case like this at feeling comfortable to stick a pin in malignancy on just you know three or four cells. Um, 
We can on occasion see metastatic carcinomas when the patient does not have an established primary diagnosis elsewhere in the body. And this is an example of a 44 year old woman who presented to the emergency room with headache and confusion. While she was there, she developed seizure activity. One of the things they did was a spinal fluid. Again, she did not have a known diagnosis of malignancy. And we saw these groups and I thought, well, you know, this looks like a metastatic carcinoma. There is a suggestion of these vacuoles that are somewhat indenting the nuclei. Um, she went on to have a workup in the, her imaging. She had enhancement of the cauda equina, which was where they were thinking the metastasis uh, was for her that was communicating with the spinal fluid. She had had cosmetic breast implants um, performed, and those were making um, a breast examination challenging, and her lobular carcinoma was anterior to the implant. Sometimes lobular carcinomas are hard to palpate even at the gross bench because they diffusely infiltrate and may not form as discrete of a mass. So this was her um, uh, primary tumor was discovered essentially by doing the imaging. And then she had that biopsied and was confirmed and the morphology was very similar to what we had seen in the spinal fluid. Her tumor as expected was strongly estrogen receptor positive, but uniquely, because this is an unexpected finding in lobular cancers was also HER2 positive. So this was a more aggressive um, lobular carcinoma. And perhaps that explains in part why she was presenting with her CNS involvement without the known breast primary, but it's something to keep in mind that even though the patient doesn't have a history of something you might expect the patient to have a history when you're seeing CNS involvement, it can happen. This is a more conventional setting where we have an older patient who's a smoker with a large lung lesion and we, we're comfortable with this cell that looks like it ate Rochester here, it's so big. Um, that we're confirming the diagnosis of malignancy on just rare cells. And then the patient had a Wang needle biopsy of a station seven node, and I was able to compare the cells from the lung cytology to the spinal fluid cytology. This is a patient who didn't, another patient who did not have a history of known malignancy and had spinal fluid that was just full of overtly cytologically malignant cells that were cohesive and growing kind of in ribbons, even in the spinal fluid. And the imaging showed this small sinonasal mass, which was later confirmed to be a high-grade sinonasal carcinoma. We can occasionally see um, primary CNS tumors. This is an example of meningioma. Um, a dural base lesion on the left is the spinal fluid and on the right is a touch prep of the tumor. So that's a single neoplastic cell. And not all brain tumors, not even all glial tumors have the expected morphology. Some glial tumors can have a distinctively epithelioid look. So you might look at these slides and think, oh, this is a metastatic carcinoma. But in this instance, this is a primary glial tumor that has a more epithelioid appearance and was involving the spinal fluid. So this is my last slide and I'll have a few minutes to take questions. This is a patient, it's a, a case from many years ago before barcoding where I got a case, um, came to me, 78 year old person, history of um, heart failure. I looked at the slides and I thought, well, these cells don't fit in spinal fluid. Could they be like choroid plexus or ependymal cells or are these some kind of metastatic cells. And what had happened was this patient had had a spinal fluid and a pleural fluid drawn on the same day. So the name was correct on the slides, but the numbers were reversed. And those are actually real mesothelial cells that came to me in a case that was labeled as CSF. So another thing to, to, to keep in mind is trust yourself. If you see something, question. My take home messages are be familiar with the slide preparation techniques and stains in your lab. Read slides slowly and carefully because one or two cells in this specimen may make a world of difference. And always read your slides in the context of available clinical and imaging data. And with that, I'm happy to take questions.
Okay, this is Donna again. Uh, Dr. Sturgis, we have a, quite a number of questions. So I'm gonna start with some questions that were on YouTube. What The first one is, what is the best RPM adjustment for CSF cytospin preparations? Wow, that is a question that is out of my league. Um, I don't know any literature on that. And the, in the laboratories that I have worked in over the years, we have used always the standard um, RPM adjustments for the standard RPMs um, for other specimens. So that is something where um, if whoever asked the question wanted to send me an email, I can do some digging and respond to them. My email is on the slide now, sturgis.charles at mayo.edu. Maybe I would learn something as well. Thank you. The second question is there, if there are RBC, RBCs on the CSF, do you consider this non-diagnostic even with other inflammatory cells? No, so I never sign out, a, I wouldn't say never, but I cannot remember signing out a spinal fluid as non-diagnostic. I just say what I see. So if I have a slide and it has, you know, say, four or five red blood cells per each 20X objective, I generally will just attribute that in my mind to a little bit of trauma from the tap. Um, if you're concerned about them, you can always just say that you're in your report. You can say like, you know, normal lignin cells identified, few lymphocytes, rare monocyte, and few erythrocytes. And then the reader will know that they were there and it will be up to the reader to decide what the significance of those cells are. So being descriptive is quality and not a cop-out. It's what you see. Okay, third question. How can we differentiate between neoplastic and inflammatory lymphoid populations? And I believe somebody else asked that online also. Yeah, so that's a good question. And what I what I was trying to emphasize, and I hope I did, is that you're going to see a few normal lymphocytes and maybe a monocyte. When it looks a little jazzy and you have increased numbers of those cells, look at the morphology. If everything is monotonous and every cell looks the same and every cell is kind of enlarged and has a nucleolus, then you may be worried that you're dealing with a clonal hematolymphoid proliferation. In a pleocytosis or reactive process, you'll see a variety of cell types, mostly small mature cells, some larger activated forms, maybe cells where the cytoplasm is getting more basophilic. There's a little bit of clearing suggesting plasmacytoid features and that'll look like a spectrum, not just one unique separate population. If you have a question, correlate that morphology with the clinical setting. If you're not entirely sure, you can be descriptive and say you have uh, lymphocytes, that there are some enlarged forms. You can't necessarily rule out a neoplastic process when possible. Share with a hematopathology colleague, uh, do uh, flow cytometry testing, like take advantage of all of those bits of information together. I would say, you know, it is much, much more common to see a reactive process than to be diagnosing a new CNS leukemia or lymphoma. So odds are generally that those conditions are reactive, but do all of the things I mentioned. Okay, we have two more questions from YouTube. What is the expectable time for delay in CSF processing? Well, I think, you know, spinal fluid is a specimen that if I have a case in my queue, I do not go home without either signing the case out or communicating with the clinician. So, you know, like if I am busy and it's seven o'clock at night and I still have a spinal fluid, I don't leave. I don't wait to, to get that out till the next day. So, you know, my advice would be to um, process these specimens as rapidly as possible and to get the information out into your electronic healthcare delivery system um, as rapidly as possible. 
Um, I don't think that I have, you know, rigid guidelines saying you have to do this in six hours or something like that. Those don't exist. It's practical. And it's also, you know, depends on the workflow in your laboratory. But I would think of these specimens as something that should not should not wait uh, another day. The last question from YouTube is, um, do you recommend the application of immunohistochemical stains directly on CSF smears? So, you know, I think that depends on your laboratory. There are laboratories where people preferentially do immunocytochemistry and they have, you know, they have systems set up and they've validated their processes to look at things on smears or cytospins or on um, thin prep prepared slides. So if that's the case in your lab, then I think that's great. If you work in a lab where you don't have those processes or they're not validated, but you can do things off of a cell block, then I would say try to make a cell block if you have a particle or a thrombin uh, or, or a fibrin clot. Uh, little bits of material in your spinal fluid, you may be surprised at what you can get. And then you can do side, you know, you can do special stain or immuno stains on the cell block. So I think you really have to tailor the response to that question to what you are able to do in your laboratory. Dr. Sturgis, we did receive a, a comment. Um, from someone who's one of the participants that said that they spin at 500 RPMs in their laboratory. Okay. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you very um, much. We have a few more questions. Given the possibility of prion diseases, some laboratories prefer to use cytospins <laughs> instead of thin preps. Your thoughts on this? And this is from Diane Davey. Another advantage of cytospins is the ability to determine blood contamination more easily. Yeah, I agree with everything that Diane is saying there. And she is certainly, she brings not only kind of uh, cytology expertise, but also empath expertise to the discussion. Um, I am I'm not a proponent of using the thin prep for spinal fluid. Uh, I have worked in, in different centers and different centers, you know, have different workflows. So, you know, I think if that works well in your center, that may be a good thing. I have talked with uh, representatives um, who manufacture the machines that from which the thin prep slides are made. And they, you know, said to me that if you have a, like a, say a CJD contamination, then you're kind of out of luck with that machine. There's nothing that they can do. So I, I think that, you know, it's a decision for the lab. My personal strong preference is cytospins for many of the reasons that I've already mentioned and also for what Dr. Davey just said there. The other thing is, is you can do a lot of different things with the cytospin because it doesn't come out kind of already alcohol fixed. So you, you have, in a sense, a little bit more of a virgin specimen um, uh, that you can do, you know, like a diff quick stain on if you're wanting nice uh, lymphoid morphology or a right stain from your hematology lab. The next question is, how do you get enough cells to do flow? I do not think we ever get enough to do flow on a CSF. Yeah, so, you know, one thing I think that's telling is if you have a, a, a patient who has a pleocytosis and you try to, like a reactive process, and you do the flow and you don't have enough cells, in some ways, now I'm not saying you make a diagnosis on a negative result or a, a non-diagnostic result, in some ways that's a little reassuring because if someone has a, a high-grade CNS lymphoma, the most common CNS lymphoma as a primary is a large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, if that's involving the, the spinal fluid and you have, you know, several hundreds of those cells on your slide, odds are you're going to get a flow result. So a negative result may, in some settings, depending on what else is going on, be a little bit reassuring. 
I have seen cases where, you know, I'm not expecting much and I've gotten a great result. And I think that that depends on your flow lab, you know, uh, essentially, like, are they used to seeing those kind of samples? And are what is the comfort level of the hematopathology consultant or, uh, you know, faculty person you're working with on the other end? And it's great to have open dialogue and share the slides and discuss the results. Uh, you can also do just a very limited number of markers, just, you know, maybe two or three markers. We're not trying to get like a whole standard, you know, multi-parameter flow report to help you to decide if the B cells that are there are clonal or not. My thought is in general, there was a comment. It, my thought is, is if you try, you're not out anything if you if it doesn't work. Well, you're out your time and you may be out some money, but you know, if you just don't do it, you never know. Go ahead, Donna. Okay, sorry, Dr. Sturgis. I think that the question regarding acceptable delay in CSF is not related to sign out, but processing. How long after collection will you reject a CSF specimen for processing? Um, I think it would depend on how the specimen has been stored. So like if, if the spinal fluid had been in, say, sent in and it went to the hematology lab and they didn't realize that they wanted cytology as well and it was then hematology lab for two days, but it was in a refrigerator where it was, you know, treated very nicely, I would process and see what I got. If it were something that like the spinal fluid was drawn and it sat in a clinic on a counter for two days and then somebody uh, sent it in, I would probably still process, but if I got, you know, really poor morphology, then I might have to say, you know, I cannot give you uh, a good result and I might have to say this is non-diagnostic. I honestly, I do not have like a number of hours as a specific cutoff. Um, I would go, you know, with a day and a half or so, just kind of thinking like routine processing of how we get things shipped around from center to center. Okay, we got a few more questions. If you're if you're able to answer them, I can stay. For um, as long is there as the a class questions last? Okay, is there a classification system planned, such as the Bethesda system? Um, there is a, like a, a, a serous fluid system that's being developed now. I do not know of a system for CSF. Um, I'm not opposed to all these fabulous systems and in some ways they really do help us to all speak a common language. I don't think, I don't know that a system would benefit spinal fluid in the sense that I'm, I would probably say the same things. Um, but I wouldn't be opposed to that and I would be happy to work on something if that did happen. And then there's a question, is there something called a PAM cell in CSF? P-A-M. Um, <laughs> there could be, um, but I, I don't have a specific answer, a PAM cell. <laughs> Um, I have a good friend named Pam and she has a lot of cells. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to be, make light of a bad situation. I don't know of that. I'm, I'm, I admit my own ignorance. Here's a good question and it's what precautions do you take to avoid instrument contamination in cases of CJD? Yeah, so, you know, every laboratory should have a, you know, it's like a CAP requirement thing and everybody should have like a policy in their laboratory for how they would um, deal with specimens that come in labeled as potentially being, you know, um, from a patient who has a prion disease. You know, I think from the perspective of protecting ourselves, meaning the people who work in the laboratories, like, cytopreparatory um, staff and the cytotechnology staff and cytopathologists, we should always be using universal precautions 
because any patient specimen could contain, you know, tuberculosis or HIV or all kinds of things that we, to which we do not want to be exposed. So we should use those in all settings. And I would tell people that they should read their internal CJD policies and always adhere to them when those questions are raised. I think the question becomes specifically in cytology about CJD is it's about our equipment and, you know, if you have a, a piece of equipment that is potentially contaminated, then, you know, you, you can, that can cost a lot of money and it can really disrupt your workflow because if that piece of equipment is integral to your processing and suddenly it's gone, then everything is backed up. And that is one reason why I'm kind of a proponent of using cytospins as opposed to using a thin prep machine. I hope that's there's a helpful. Question on, thank you. Um, there's a question on special stains. Would you do special stains on cytology smears, such as uh, GMS and mucicarmine? Again, I think that that would be great if your lab is, you know, set up to perform those in that way. Uh, one thing that might be better about doing them on, if instead of doing them on a direct smear from spinal fluid would be making a cytospin and then doing it on the cytospin because it would show you where on the slide to look because the material would be in a certain area. It also would concentrate the sample a little bit. Uh, so, you know, I, I think if I were wanting to do any kind of ancillary slide-based test on spinal fluid I and I weren't using a cell block, I would probably want to use some type of concentration um, equipment like a cytospin or cytocentrifuge in order to make the slide and then use that slide for my IHC, my ICC, my special stains, whatever I were going to be doing. Okay, there's just two more questions. What is the adequacy criteria for CSF? Do you call it negative when the sample is acellular and contains only blood? So, uh, like I started off saying in my talk, I don't, I, I essentially never call a spinal fluid um, unsatisfactory or non diagnostic. I just say what I see. And that's because, you know, a normal spinal fluid in a physiologic sense should have very, very few to no cells in it. It's just clear fluid. Um, so, that, that would be my response to that question. Okay, and one last question. Um, one of the participants wants to know what type of preparation is preferable in your laboratory. Uh, so here at Mayo, we are using cytospins and um, we commonly have both stains, the, a pap stain and a dip quick stain. We do a lot of sharing back and forth between um, hem the hematology staff and the cytology staff. Um, but I have worked in other labs where the preparation techniques were different. So I really think that the best thing to do is, you know, decide what's best for you and then make yourself very comfortable with that. You know, if, if you are seeing a, a spinal fluid and it's prepared in a way that you're not accustomed to seeing it, and you're trying to make a very important call on just a few cell events, it's going to be more challenging. So one thing that I struggle with occasionally here at Mayo, um, which I sometimes had the same experience when I was working at Cleveland Clinic, which is a very kind of a similar environment, large practice with a lot of consult cases is, you know, I would see preparations that were coming from laboratories all over the country or even all over the world where someone is sending um, a slides in for a second opinion. In general, we didn't see, we don't see a lot of consults for spinal fluid because you have to make a decision pretty quickly about treatment. And if it takes two or three days to send something out, you may not have the time to do that. But when I do see those consults, they're often prepared in ways that are different than what I'm used to. Uh, so, you know, I, I see a lot of different preps. My my strong preference is for the cytospin or cytocentrifuge and to have one slide alcohol fixed and pap stained and the other slide 
air dried and modified deemed so stained. Thank you again, Dr. Sturgis, for this outstanding presentation on cerebral spinal fluid. Um, we're out of time, but this is an area we all could use a refresher on. So thank you very much for taking time out of your day to present. Well, it's, been, it's been my pleasure. I hope I, I couldn't answer all the questions and I hope I um, didn't disappoint. Um, my email is up there and anybody who has a question wants to send me a message offline, I'll respond. And everybody in this challenging time with, you know, viral pandemic and social unrest, everybody out there in cytology land, be well, stay healthy, take care of yourselves and be safe. I agree. Thank you very much. I'm going to log off now. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.